Our next speaker is Paul Klenz Larsen, um, who is associated with the National Museum of Denmark Department of Conservation, um, but he also um, has many other roles. He's a teacher as well and um, works with a number of, uh, of cultural heritage uh, organizations in Denmark. Um, Paul holds a master's degree and a PhD in building physics from the Technical University in Copenhagen. And he has worked for many years as a consultant for historic buildings, especially churches, and is a senior consultant for the National Museum of Denmark, and uh, a superb engineer and a very, very astute uh, student of the way buildings really work. So when we get his his talk, we will give you Paul Klenz Larson. Thank you. Can you hear me? That's better. Good morning, everybody. And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to, to give this presentation today. I uh, would start by saying that the purpose of my presentation is to demonstrate that saving energy is not incompatible with preservation of our collections. Uh, you can safely cut most of the energy costs without the risk of losing your head. But first, so I have to go here. Yes, first we must, to do this, first we must accept that a museum store or an archive for that sake is not meant for people to work in or to stay in. And because of that, the temperature in a store or in an archive can be lower than what is needed for human comfort. Proper clothing, however, is important for the comfort of the museum staff when objects are moved occasionally in and out of the building or the store. So this is a very fundamental starting point for, for this lecture. Low temperature is a benefit uh, for the conservation or the preservation of most objects. A low temperature will retard, as we have seen yesterday, will retard, delay most chemical reactions, whereas a high temperature will accelerate the decomposition of most organic and also synthetic, synthetic it's difficult, materials, artificial materials. Yes. Let's go a little deeper into that. Hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is a main agent of decay. It's controlled both by temperature and by relative humidity. Now let's uh, define the decay rate of one. It's a relative decay rate of one at 20 degrees and 50 percent RH. This is the starting point for a very common specification for a museum or an archive. 20 degrees, 50 percent is one. So any combination of temperature and relative humidity with the same decay rate defines a line of equal decay rate. This was sort of invented many years ago and is by some authors referred to as a, an isoperm, an, is, an evil, an even, not evil, even decay rate or even permanence rate. This graph that I show you here is for a chemical reaction with a 100 kilojoule 
activation energy. According to the Arrhenius principle, uh, the RH sensitivity, according to the law of mass action, uh, and that is proportional to the water activity or the relative humidity. Now, these are the thermodynamical details. I will not dive deeper into this. Uh, an increase in temperature by 5 degrees will double the decay rate, and a reduction in temperature of 5 degrees will slow down decay to only half the speed. This is very fundamental. If we look at the total diagram now, at zero degrees, the decay is 20 times slower than at, and then at 20 degrees. And this clearly indicates the importance of temperature and that relative humidity is less significant for this process as long as it's kept moderate. So temperature is really decisive. And this is very similar to the, the concept of the time-weighted preservation index that Jim uh, showed us yesterday. So this is all very fundamental, but it's very important to keep in mind for the, for the following. Hydrolysis is particularly important for paper collections, for archives. Here is a recent, recently built store for the Royal Library in, in Copenhagen. It's a multi-level building, as you can see, and it's, uh, it has full air conditioning, cooling, heating, humidification, and dehumidification. This is expensive to install, it's expensive to run, and to maintain. The advantage of HVAC systems is this. It is possible to meet very tight specifications for both temperature and relative humidity. The cost, however, we have measured in this building, the cost or the energy consumption is quite large. It's 28 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. I will in this lecture quote the energy consumption, not by the area of the building, but by the volume, because it makes it easier to compare uh, different buildings. Notice also that the uh, decay rate, according to these lines of even decay, equal decay, is around, it's a little higher than 1, it's around 1.2. According to many, many uh, recommendations, many standards, this is really good. This is, in fact, the best. According to the ASHRAE, for instance, this is class AA. Very good. Highest grade. However, a museum store or an archive can work without heating, but with dehumidification as the only climate control. The technology is slightly different. I will not go into any details here, but the absorption dehumidifier, which is shown here, is a very simple and rather robust technology. It has been used for decades by industry and, and by military, so it works very well. It works at low temperatures and it works at a very low energy consumption. The temperature variation <clears throat> can be reduced by the thermal inertia of the building. This was already demonstrated by Tim in his previous lecture. And uh, Tim also showed that even very heavy structures cannot 
deal with the annual variation. Now this particular building is a, an old military building and the roof is very heavy. It's a half a meter of solid concrete. So it is indeed a heavy building. It was designed as a nuclear safe shelter for fighter airplanes during the Cold War, but is now taken into use as a temporary store for a collection of furniture. As you can see, the store is densely packed, but has quite good free air circulation along the roof to ensure an even distribution of temperature and humidity. Now here is the climate record of this building over five years. The RH, the relative humidity, is quite constant thanks to the dehumidifier. Uh, notice the steep fall as it is turned on at the beginning of these five years. So we cannot do without this mechanical device. The annual temperature variation is from zero in winter up to 25 degrees in summer. Now I take it this is way out of, comf of, of the comfort zone of, of most of you, but the furniture doesn't mind. This is what it looks like in the, uh, in the diagram here. Because there is no heating, the annual temperature uh, follow that outside. Still, the RH is controlled within very tight limits by the dehumidifier. Now, the energy consumption for this building is around 6 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. This is less than 25% of, uh, of the archive for the Royal Library. So is this worse or better? Now the uh, decay rate is slower. It's only half the decay rate in the Royal Library building. So uh, I would suggest that from a cost-effective effectiveness analysis, this building performs better. Nevertheless, this is way out of the recommendations or standards uh, that you can find anywhere. Uh, and this is a paradox that I really can't, as an engineer, can't understand. According to the ASRAE, I think this would be C or D. This is another museum building, a museum store in Ribe that was already mentioned by Tim. And this performs even better. The walls and the ceiling have quite thick thermal insulation, but the concrete floor is not insulated. So it's precisely the model that Tim showed you earlier. The store has dehumidification, but no heating. This is the interior of the building before it was stuffed with uh, objects. You see the uh, small ducts below the ceiling. They are for the dehumidification. The ceiling height is six meter, and most of the space is occupied by compactors compact racks. The mezzanine floor, you can see it's to, well, you can see the mezzanine floor you were on. It's, a, uh, it's an open metal grid to allow free air circulation within the entire space. And as Tim has already showed you, there is very little temperature difference uh, between the floor and the ceiling, less than two degrees all year. The winter and summer extremes in temperature in this building are much reduced as compared to the previous one, as compared to the shelter. And this is done by the right combination of 
thermal insulation and heat capacity, exactly as suggested by Tim before. The temperature range is now 8 to 16 degrees, you've seen this already, and the relative humidity is 40 to 60 percent over the year. The decay rate, or the relative decay rate, is even lower than before. It's down to 0.5, or three times less than in the Royal Library building. The energy consumption for this building, which is just for the fan and for the dehumidifier, is 1.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So this building is by far the most cost-efficient building of the three I've shown. Still, the, uh, the climate is, is out of range of most of the recommendations that we use for archives and museum buildings. I show you here the climate record for one year, but it's, it's quite, it's not very exciting really. It's very stable and there is no daily variation whatsoever. So this is what you can achieve if you build uh, from this concept. And it is very simple. Not much to it really. You need well insulated walls and ceilings and you need a floor without insulation to absorb heat in summer and release heat in winter. The relative humidity is controlled by a dehumidifier, but mind you that the natural infiltration rate, which is how much outside air you let into the building, should be as low as possible. This is a very important part of this concept. The building must be airtight, or as airtight as possible. Don't leave the doors and windows open. So it should be down to once every day or even less. This is the winter situation. Heat gain from the floor keeps the temperature moderate in winter. And in most cases, dehumidification is not really needed in winter. And this is because the temperature is about right for the moderate relative humidity and it is further buffered either by the objects or perhaps by the wall lining as shown by Tim uh, with clay or other materials. We can expand this concept further. We can run the dehumidifiers by photovoltaic elements on the roof. And because dehumidification is mainly needed in summer, there is plenty of, sun, of sunshine to, to generate the electricity. So this concept is what you might call energy neutral, since it needs no external power supply apart from the sun. We can further expand this concept by replacing uh, dehumidification by direct solar heating. In this model, we use the attic as a solar collector to allow exactly the heat gain that we need for humidity control in summer. Of course, the summer temperatures will then be higher than before, so this is not really an option for very fragile or delicate collections. But for many standard museums collections, it's really accept it's quite acceptable to go up to maybe 23, 24 degrees in summer. This design is entirely passive and it's free of maintenance. It will work for a thousand years or maybe 5,000 as the grave that Tim showed you without any human involvement and it can be made. It's even cheap to build. Of course, it all relies on this diagram. It's a very central one that Tim has already showed. 
the heat storage in the ground below the building. It's important to realize that the ground below the building should is a part is a, in building physics. It's a part of the building. It's not it's not an external thing. And again, this diagram shows the the situation in winter and in summer. To the left is the winter situation with an inside temperature of 7 degrees Celsius and to the right the summer situation with 15 or 16 degrees indoor in August. And the floor acts as a heating element in winter and a cooling element in summer. Now you may argue this may work in Denmark but it will definitely never work in Australia. But it will. Uh, it will in fact work in most inhabited places on Earth. But, of course, with different ranges for the temperature. In dry climate zones, I must admit, we may have too low RH at some periods, so humidification may be required. Computer modeling, as Tim said, you must be skeptical to computer modeling, but they will, computer models will predict the performance in any location. So you can take this building, once you have made the, the model, <coughs> and locate it anywhere in the world. And we did test this in several locations, and I will show you one in Canberra, Australia, that we did for a recent project. So this is an, an, this is a, an annual, uh, this is one year of climate, not climate records, but climate predictions. The, uh, the temperature is the red one. The temperature variation is 12 to 18 degrees, which is quite acceptable, even by, even by the standards. The relative humidity is 50 to 75 uh, percent. Slightly high in, in winter, but this is because winter is summer and summer is winter. So, but you may need dehumidification in some periods. Still, this will run in Canberra at less than one kilowatt hours per cubic meter per year. And this will be the case in most locations that you can think of. So, so really, this is very simple. It's a, uh, the concept is not protected by any <clears throat> by any uh, copyright or any limitations, so feel free to use it for your next project. We will be we will be prepared, Tim and I and our colleagues, to help you in case you need it. But uh, please refer to the web page for further information. And thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we're now prepared to take questions for either Tim or Paul uh, from the audience. And are there any questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Ford. Yes, we've heard about um, yesterday formic acid, for example, being damaging to paper. Um, does the low air exchange rate cause a build-up of endogenous pollutants, um, which may to some extent offset the, the better temperature in RH? But I'm not talking about the economics of it here, now, just whether there's been any monitoring of, of, of these sorts of things. It's difficult for me to hear, but you were asking about internally generated pollutants, is that correct? And it is true. And you may need some, uh, some air cleaning. But since you circulate the air anyway, it, it's really not an option. And mind you, outside air is also not clean. You need to clean the outside air as well. So uh, there, as we saw yesterday, there are different sort of uh, components in the outside and the inside air. But it is true that there may be a buildup of organic compounds and so forth. On the other hand, you keep out the ozone, which is really very corrosive to any material, and the nitric acids, the noxious. So it's, we've done, or my colleague Morton has done quite extensive monitoring on the air quality in, in these uh, stores, 
there will be a publication in Melbourne, in the ICMCC next year, meeting in Melbourne, which is exactly on the air quality. So, so this has been thoroughly investigated. Spoiler alert. But it is true. You need, sometimes you need to clean the air. <laughs> Spoiler alert. It's quite feasible to do it without air filtration in many cases. Would you agree, Paul? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Martin. Um, hi, I'm curious to um, ask whether you've tested this model in a tropical country with, let's say, a monsoon summer and a, and a dry winter. Um, I'm just curious to hear if, if that would work or if you have some ideas about that as well. Well, it, it, it will work, but as I said, temperature will be higher. So, I mean, that's you can still control the relative humidity very easily. But temperature will, of course, be higher. So if you cannot accept going up to 25 or whatever, 30 degrees, then you need cooling. That's true. But, I mean, you have to, to take the, the conditions as they are given. I think Tim may have a comment here. Yes. Uh, I would just add that I started off by showing the weather on the northern European plain. And all of, all of our work begins with an analysis of the weather where we are. We have done work in Egypt, in a, in a high place in Egypt. And there, the dominant effect is solar radiation and also night radiation. And so our proposed solution is different. But always you have to analyze the situation with the weather as it is. And it is this that is made su such a nonsense of standards that become international. They're based in one place, and then they just spread like a meme over the whole world, and they're just adhered to by engineers. We, we argue for analysis first. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a song? Yeah. Um, just a comment, uh, as a member of the ASHRAE committee, uh, I take your point that the AA and A are, are misused when they're generalized. In the table that specifies AA, A, B, C, D, it's under the section of the table which is specifically for museums and libraries <coughs> and galleries, and there's a separate section for archives. Also, if you follow along to the last column in the table which gives the benefits and risks, of A, 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 B, C, D. I, f I fought quite hard to make sure that it, every single cell in that table says limited lifetime for um, uh, chemically unstable materials all the way down. But you're right. The, and I, I, take, I, I think in the next edition I will suggest that we somehow add to the nomenclature that there would be A, A preservation index 40 and AA preservation index 300, which would have different specifications. So we do need to tack, we need to attach right to that shorthand of the AA and AA, the implications for uh, archival lifetimes. It's in the table, but engineers pull out the single target. Yeah, uh, I take that. I've, this was not <clears throat> meant to be a personal uh, sort of, so, yeah. Are there other questions? <laughs> Did you have a question? Oui. Oui, bonjour. Ça sera en français, désolé. Euh, deux questions. Euh, la première concerne en fait la qualité des argiles que vous utilisez euh, dans vos briques. Est-ce que vous avez une typologie d'argile spécifique Et deuxième question, est-ce que vous avez travaillé sur des argiles fonctionnalisées Merci. Can anybody translate the questions, please? Is there a specific type of brick? Uh, and uh, second part is, have you worked with what, what the translator called functionalized clay, which I think is a, a kind of 
are you alluding to uh, new formulations of s concrete, cement, or clay? Somehow surface enhanced, surface high surface activity clays of some kind? Could you maybe uh, uh, explain a little further your question? Well, perhaps I can uh, answer that far. Uh, yes, I, I, I was confused by functional clay. Um, clay from bricks is a mixture of clays, montmorillonite, illite, and of those, montmorillonite has by far the greatest moisture exchange. So again, it comes down to an analysis of the local conditions. Because it's a low humidity in here, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> It comes down again to analysis that the clay bricks we showed you are local. And that's important because we want to keep the cost down. And it so happens that the local clays in northern Denmark are naturally quite good humidity buffers. But not all are. If you have a, a predominantly kaolinite-based clay, that has almost no absorption at all. So our... our our point, as always, is you start locally. And my interest in uh, vernacular building is based on this, that until very recently, people built with what was available within 200 meters of where they lived. It was too expensive to do anything else. And therefore, that's why we talk for, about analyzing, firstly, the weather, but also the geology. And even the underground storage we talked about, the underground thermal storage, that varies from place to place. There are places with a, a sandy uh, base where water percolates through. And, and, and there you get a constant temperature underground. It's not controlled by the building at all. It all boils down, really, to understanding your place instead of applying an international norm where you have a, a group of engineers, computer programmers that just go from dump from place to place and say, we'll, we'll use the international style here, regardless of local conditions. So we're not only trying to save energy, but also saving embodied energy and also using a, a lot of local intelligence. As a direct answer, yes, we have tried many different materials. And that, again, is listed on the website, uh, the materials we have looked at for their buffer quality. Did that answer your question? Uh, were you thinking of lightweight concrete or in, in functionalized clay? We didn't quite understand that. En fait, actuellement, dans les recherches un peu pointues dans les laboratoires, notamment qui sont liés aux recherches en inorganique sur les argiles, il y a la possibilité de mettre des fonctions spécifiques chimiques à ces argiles-là pour optimiser certaines propriétés. Donc c'était dans, dans ce sens-là, savoir si, si soit ils, en effet, ils ont utilisé une terre locale qui a ces propriétés-là, mais s'ils avaient eu une, une recherche également sur des argiles un peu plus poussées d'un point de vue technique. Voilà. Mais ils ont répondu, enfin, le monsieur a répondu à ma, à ma question, donc c'est très bien. Merci. Ok. Uh, um, yes. He was talking about enhanced, uh, enhanced clays with additives. Yes. yes. And yes, um, yes, I asked about your research. Yes. Uh, I understand that, but I come back to this point that these bricks that we used are extremely cheap. They're not a laboratory product, they're an industrial product that we just take at a at a point in their manufacture, we take what is available. It doesn't need to be optimized. And this is why I said we could coat the walls with artsorb, but there is no need. And that's why we have developed this program to calculate from the measurements what buffer performance one can expect from materials just as you dig them up from the ground. So although I, I have nothing against these efforts to optimize and put in uh, absorbers, um, I still come back to the fact that very often there are raw materials that do the job. And in the case of the, of the Danish clays, they're also very alkaline and they absorb pollutant gases. 
And that's an advantage we just get as a, as a byproduct. And we could enhance that by mixing in active carbon or, or active alumina into the mixture. But really, there is no need to do that. Okay, do we have any final question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your presentations and your attitude uh, of degrowth more than sustainability. I just have a question. I, I was wondering, you were talking about storage buildings. Maybe the answer is on your website, but how about uh, museums? Will it be more complicated to have such efficient results with a lot of people coming in and out and things like that? Um, yes. Well, we do get asked this. And the answer is that because regulations demand so many litres of fresh air per second per person, um, the air exchange rate goes up from ideally nothing, or once every two days, goes up to maybe once an hour or, or twice an hour. And this brings us back to the buffering capacity that one can still use a humidity buffering and a thermal buffering for one day. And the consequence of this is that if you build an exhibition space using for example, these clay bricks, then you can achieve buffering for the opening hours of the museum. And this means that you can build a museum which is quiet and peaceful because it has no air conditioning. That air conditioning is waiting for the evening when the museum closes, and then you can switch it on to regenerate the conditions you want for the opening. It, it's particularly useful in uh, historic house museums where you don't want to put in large air, condi uh, air conditioning ducts. So what you can do is you can put in small ducts that make a ferocious noise, but only when there's no one there. So there is, <coughs> there is scope for extending these principles to exhibitions. I have another comment to this, but I'm not sure how much time we have left. But there is one important issue that I should mention here, because it is true that in museum buildings there are many other uh, parameters. One important thing, though, to mention is that most museum buildings, the uh, supply of heat, of moisture, and fresh air is mixed in sort of one system. And this makes it all very complicated. It's really an, an advantage if you can separate them. If you have heating, which should be preferably uh, radiant heat in, in a museum, either floor heating or wall heating, and you have humidity control in a separate system, and then you have perhaps uh, a little bit of, of air quality control as a separate system or in the same system. But there is one museum, recent museum in, in Munich, in the Brandhorst Museum in Munich, some of you may have been there, which has exactly done this, separated the temperature control from the humidity control. And this is one way to go. You can never come down to one kilowatt hour per cubic meter, but you can go very much lower than in conventional systems. So this is, <coughs> this is an entire different lecture, but I may give that another occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, if you want to say the same thing and sound very engineer-like and uh, that Paul just was talking about, you just say to the engineer, we want the latent separated from the sensible. And, you know, they'll, they'll think, wow, are you knowledgeable or what? <laughs> so anyway, thank you. And um, 